So this is a brief walkthrough of the interface that Amos uses. Um, it's a relatively straightforward program to use, it does a lot of things automatically for you in its basic setup. There are a few things that you need to know in able to draw models efficiently. Um, so the first thing you've got to do in Amos is link it to a data set. It's relatively straightforward as a process. You click on this here, select data files, and if you hover over absolutely anything here, you see it tells you exactly what it is. So first thing, you just need to get it to talk to a data set. It doesn't host any data itself. It just links to an SPSS data set. So you just find your particular file you want. Let's say it's the motivational interview example, and then just click OK. And it's now linked it to a data set. And if we select this here, it says list variables in the data set. You can see that it's only got five variables in this data set, but they all appear here. So there's a few different bits and bobs we can look at this interface. The first thing is, is you can draw on observed variables. Remember, observed variables are ones always in a rectangular box. We could also draw an unobserved variable, a latent variable. And then it says draw a latent variable or add an indicator to a latent variable. So these things are very closely related to each other, really. So to draw an unobserved variable, we can click on that and simply draw a box. And then we select it and we can write the variable name in. And if you do the variable name, that's the same as a variable name in the data set. It automatically links the two things up. There's actually an easier way of doing things though. Instead, what we could do is just take this from our variables in our data set and drop it in. And it automatically creates observed variables for all these things if we wanted it to. So it's a lot easier than drawing and labeling it. We can just simply copy and them over from the variables in the data set. So the other aspect of it here is um, we can draw an unobserved variable. So again, we simply draw an oval. And obviously, an one of these variables doesn't actually exist in our data set. It's actually made up of lots of different observed variables. So to set that up, all we need to do is select this, draw a latent variable or add an indicator. So we select that, and then we click. And then we've got five variables there, and then we can just drop them straight into there. So we then give this a name, which would be, say, motivational. And then, of course, we'd also have to label the residuals, the errors. So we can just call these E1, E2, E3, E4, and E5. So we could just do that. We can actually make things a little bit easier than that. Once we've got these, um, residuals here, so all the errors here, well it's a relatively straightforward process and what we do with them because they're always going to have the name E1, E2, etc, etc. So what we can actually do is go to plugins and just say name unobserved variables. If you click on that, it automatically gives those numbers for us which is quite a useful tool. We don't have to actually draw the latent variable in that way. We can simply from scratch Click on this, draw the circle, and draw on our five indicators. And then, as before, you can just drop things into it. So, to draw in the models is relatively straightforward. If we say we have another variable, we put autonomy as a separate thing there. If we were predicting this latent variable, would predict this, then we simply need to draw an arrow between the two. And remember, now anything that's got an arrow going into it needs a residual, and that's where we select this. Add a unique variable to an existing variable, click on that, and then that gives us our error there. And we can name one observed variables and so on, give that a label, and so on. If we were to draw covariances between variables, again, very straightforward process. We just simply select the two we want to draw the covariances between, but don't worry too much about that now. So to draw the models is a relatively straightforward 
procedure. There's lots of different ways you can go about doing it. Generally speaking, I like to recommend just if the observed variables, just drop them straight in from there. So they're the useful basic things if you just wanted to, to draw the model. But there are lots of other things that we can look at. So let's say, for example, we've got a very simple model. I'll just quickly draw a model. We've got one latent variable. We've got, so we've got two observed variables, and we're looking to see how this latent variable predicts these. So I'll name on observed variables, and then we just need to give that a name. Let's call it db1, and we can call that one db2. So there's some little basic tools here that are quite useful for allowing you to select and move things. So if you select one object at a time, so you can select that, turn to blue, so we've selected those objects. Or we could select all the objects in the data set, and then we've got deselect all objects. So we can select different objects. The reason why you may want to do this, say for example, we just select that, that, and then we can go into the move objects. This allows us to move the objects around if you want to neaten up the diagram, because they can get a bit messy sometimes. If you didn't select them all, what would happen when we try and move it? It stretches it and it looks a bit ridiculous. So that's why it's useful to select things before you move them. You can also duplicate objects if you want. So we just drag off it and we can create as many objects as you want that way. This is just the delete so you can just get rid of things nice and easy using that. There's a few other things, so resize, that can be quite useful. Um, for example, let's say we add that as acceptance all. That doesn't fit, so to make it neater, we can select resize objects, and we can just move that until it fits it quite neatly. Rotate as well, so we can rotate the indicators on a latent variable, so that's a rotate. So we can just rotate everything around, so if things fit on the screen, and so on. Some of these you tend not to use too much, like reflect indicators of latent variable um, aren't used. Parameter values isn't used too much either. These two, though, are really important. These two, one of them is the analysis properties, and one says calculate estimates. As, when it says calculate estimates, that merely means run the model. So analysis properties, if you click on that, it gives you analysis window. And these are all the different things it can do. As you can see, there's different sorts of ways of creating the model and so on. Um, got outputs, really useful window, this one. This is all the different outputs that you can have. So this is a really basic one. So hardly anything's ticked as default. Generally speaking, you'd like, especially if you've got indirect effects you'd be interested in, you'd want to tick that. Some other things are quite useful. In particular, you may want modification indices. This tells you ways in which you can improve the model. It's got a little threshold number. They're basically for modification indices, um, it's just a way of saying covariances between these measures are very, very high, or there could be some issue with these two variables. Do you want to control for that with the covariance arrow? There's no actual strict rule to it, as in, you know, what is a problematic number? Um, I'll talk through that in a lecture to some extent, just so you can see that in some detail. And then bootstrap. Bootstrap's really important. Bootstrap can be very important, particularly if you're looking at indirect effects, because that's how any indirect effects would be observed in the data using bootstrapping. So get to do a bootstrap, you need to click perform bootstrap. This is the number of bootstrap samples. Default to 200. Generally when I do it, I change it to 500 or even 1000. The more bootstrap samples you ask for, the longer it will take to run your model. Then there's two different bootstrap strap options, percent, percentile confidence intervals or bias corrected confidence intervals. The most common one generally recommended is the bias corrected. So if you do this, this will give you bootstrapped regression coefficients for the associations within the data set. And if you have any indirect effects, it will also produce them for them too. So it can be quite useful. This here, the Bonstein bootstrap, is actually a model fit in the C. It's not used very much because it's quite a harsh model in the C. I've only ever used had to use it once myself. Um, if you were to ask for this as a model fit in the C, it's basically you want it to be non-significant. If you were to ask for this and you click that, 
it won't actually give you bootstraps for anything else so you couldn't ask for that and that's at the same time you can only perform one bootstrap at once so you need to take perform bootstrap and ask for the Ballenstein bootstrap if you were going to use that but generally speaking I wouldn't recommend using that one particularly so that's the analysis properties and then if we just click on this this is calculate estimates this is actually what runs your entire model so let's say for example we wanted to run a model quickly so let's say we want to look at the model as that we're going to use as the practice so we'll just drop in the motivational interviewing variables into here it looks a bit messy but it really doesn't matter for the, this example and then we'll ask it to name our unobserved variables so if we were to run this now it will give us an error message and the error message as you can see makes absolutely no sense at all what this error message simply is is you haven't saved your project and given it a name so if you were to just give it a name let's call it practice and then we can click run calculate estimates and it's now calculate the estimates you can't it doesn't actually really look like it's done anything but what you can do if you click on view text this produces your amos output so the first thing you can see it gives you a chi-squared value but we tend not to look at that in this case actually it says the model fits but we don't need to worry about that too much and we've got this little window here well the first thing you're ever going to look at when you're doing these things is probably going to be your model fit indices you can select each one individually if you want but you might as well just have all the model fit indices open so there's your normed chi-squared that is your tucker lewis index your comparative fit index these ones incremental fit index and norm fit index are sometimes reported as well generally speaking the rules for all these are the same 0.9 means acceptable above 0.95 means a very good fit there's your MRSEA or Ramsey as people call it is um, a good fit as well you'll know if you remember one of them is missing the standardized root mean residual there's a reason why this is mi missing it's because it's a plugin and if you want that what you need to do is go to plugins standardized root mean residual click run and there you go it produces it in this little box instead so if you just go back to our output so we've got our model fit indices here and then we will not look at our estimates and click on estimates this are all the factor loadings so the association between empathy of empathy and the overarching latent variable adaptation overarching latent variable and so on you'll see here this one doesn't have a p-value it doesn't it's the first one that's used in creation of the latent variable so it doesn't sort of have any bone barrier to the reference point so we can look at this and you can see we've got there's your regression coefficient that's a standard error and that's a p-value when it gives you the three stars it's just less than 0 0.001 We click on this and we go to matrices so we've got standardized total effects and direct effects and so on this is where we can actually look at bootstraps as well so this gives you your bootstrap estimate bootstrap standard error and lower bounds and upper bounds of the confidence intervals and whether things are significant or not you can look at them all in one go here so there's your lower bound of your 95 percent confidence interval the upper bound and the p-value so these are just an alternative way of producing the same statistics as these obviously this is done through bootstrapping so the numbers are slightly different than each other they're not going to produce the same things and bootstrapping generally is a really good method for assessing anything it's not influenced by outliers and distributions and so on and um, if we were to have indirect effects here it would open up allow us to look at these bias corrected um, confidence intervals for the indirect effects it's all zeros and blank here because this model doesn't have any form of indirect effect 
One other thing that you can do as well, you can actually get the model to put the estimates on it. So if you click here, view the output path diagram, and then you can see what the regression coefficients are. So these are the unstandardized. If you click standardized, this essentially gives you your beta estimates. When you're reporting things in a model, you can either report unstandardized estimates and the standard error and star it if it's significant. But generally speaking, it's just a bit easy to present the data when you've just given a standardized estimate instead because it's just one figure. So you can show one figure, the higher the figure, the stronger the association between the variables is. So you can see how AMOS will plot that point. Generally speaking, if you do a figure, you would not use AMOS's interface to create a figure. It's a bit messy. You're better off creating figures in PowerPoint, then you can edit them a lot more readily and you don't have to mess around with resize and changing things and so on. It can become a little bit challenging. So that's your, your general interface that you've got. Everything here is also accessible through these windows it's through the tabs at the top as well so you run the model calculate estimates there view analysis properties opens up the analysis window and so on so you've got all these little options and so on to get used to amos basically you've got to practice using it but it's quite a neat simple way of doing some fairly complex modeling as soon as you've done some basic models it's really easy to sort of build things up and create much larger models